Hey, are you tired of running around in the hamster wheel of business ownership? You know, like that little hamster just like, you know, spinning around, spinning around, going crazy, not getting anything done. Uh, today's guest is a guy named Stan Genetic. He is uh, the owner of a landscaping business in Minnesota. He is the host of the Landscape Business Pro uh, podcast. He's got a YouTube channel, a bunch of other stuff going on where he's helping business owners and contractors all over North America. And I want to invite you to just tune in and listen to a couple, you know, blue collar contractor guys just uh, shoot the bull for about a half hour, 40 minutes here, uh, where we talk about how, you know, the key to you staying in the game, not just staying in the game, but winning the game of business is you got to be committed to learning new things and reinventing yourself. Uh, we talk about how, you know, if day one, your focus is profit first and then revenue, second, uh, you're going to be okay. Many, many, so many business owners are so concerned with top line revenue and they ignore profit and that's, uh, that's going to mess you up. He talks about, uh, which I thought was good, he says, hey, I want to be a jack of all trades, but I want to be a master of like two. <laughs> and, uh, and so how he chose a couple different niches uh, to help him not only be more profitable, but to even out the uh, ups and downs in the schedule and things like that. We talk about how to market to that niche and how to differentiate in a massively competitive market and why focusing on how your clients feel is truly your secret weapon. So join us, uh, Stan and I, today on the Strong Printer Podcast. And uh, when you're done, head over to iTunes. Give us a rating and a review. We'd really appreciate it. And finally, if you know somebody who would be a great fit for me to talk to on the Strong Printer Podcast, please have them reach out to me uh, through motorhard.com or you can email me at tom at motorhard.com. Without further ado, Stan by the way, what's a do mean? Further ado, like where'd that come from? I don't know. Without further ado, Mr. Stan Genetic. And today's guest is a guy who is uh, doing just that. He's working hard to keep himself off the hamster wheel as well as contractors all over North America via his YouTube channel and his website and some things like that. So today I want to welcome Stan Genetic to the Strong Conure Podcast. How you doing, man? Tom, I'm doing excellent. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to speak with your audience. And uh, I love what you say about the hamster wheel because I tell you what, first and foremost, Tom, I'm a contractor by trade. I'm 43 right now. I've been doing this since I was 13 years old. 30 flipping years of being a contractor. They say you don't master something unless you have 10,000 hours. Well, guess what? I got 30,000 flipping hours in doing this crap. And uh, what I've come to, I've, I've learned that there's a lot of inside things that don't come right away. You can't learn it in one year, two years, three, five, 10 years. I'm still, to this day, Tom, I'm still learning new things. And it kind of struck me you know, I had a, a weird opportunity. The Lord works in mysterious ways, I always say, and I had this weird chance to share what I've learned. And uh, this guy named Cameron Gatsaw came and said, hey, let's let's do a, a, a podcast for landscapers. And I'm like, hey, you're flipping nuts, right? <laughs> right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and I'm like, hey, first off, uh, you know, I do landscaping, I do excavating, I do retaining well. So as a contractor, let me share who I am. Uh, you know, I, I run basically an outdoor service company. We do hardscaping. So we'll demo a house, Tom, knock it down, dig the basement, build retaining walls for shopping centers. We also do lawn maintenance and things like that. And I said to him, we're too busy to listen to podcasts. And I was so wrong. I was so absolutely wrong. But at that point, I didn't realize it. So I said, you know what? Let's give it a go. What the heck? You know, I'm, 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 I'm always up for something new. You got to get you got to try everything once in life. Right. Mm -hmm. And so we gave the, the, the podcast a shot there and uh, started recording. And then I started to go on YouTube because, you know, I don't watch TV, let alone YouTube. I'll be totally honest with you. But some of the guests that I had on were YouTube guys that had, you know, a large following and 
built audiences. And then I realized, you know, some of the guys I'm interviewing are, you know, industry specific and then outside of the industry. But the industry specific guys you would think wouldn't have very large following. But we're talking about a guy that mows lawns that has 22,000 followers. Crazy, isn't it? It's nuts. Yeah. And you realize there is a whole segment of our population of contractors of people that are hungry for information. They're just, they want to wrap their heads around anybody that will give them something tangible, something that they can actually take away and go, boom, I want to apply this towards my business. And that was the focus of my show. So every show that I do on the Landscape Business Pro podcast, it's got to be rock solid. I won't interview people unless there's something that they will actually say, because I've heard those shows that are filled with fluff, Tom. Mm -hmm. And that's not your show. Trust me. But I've heard those shows and I'm just like, uh, you know what? I've talked to my guests. If you don't have something tangible to take away, I'm sorry, it's not going to work out. And I've turned people down multiple times because I don't feel like there's going to be some benefit. So that's the point. What I hope you and I gain out of this about me being on your show is something rock solid that your audience can take away. Now, now watch this time. We probably won't say anything worthwhile for the next 30 minutes. <laughs> so actually, uh, I, I think the first worth, worthwhile thing that, that we can talk about, and you, you touched on it earlier in, in your little intro there, you talked about learning new things and how you've been in the game, uh, you know, 30,000 hours plus. And when you were like, man, since 13, I'm thinking, man, you're like Yoda. <laughs> you know, you're, you're Master Yoda of the, uh, of, of the landscape contracting world. But learning new things is... Uh, what I really believe the key to staying in the game this long. Okay. I'm going to have to say that that's not an option, Tom. Uh, it's not just staying in the game. It's you just, you can't be in the business if you don't learn. I mean, you're going to every single day, you're going to be faced with some learning challenge, something, and you're just going to have to either overcome it or you're going to succumb to it. You've just got one of two options. So, you know, re re go ahead. No, I'm sorry, Tom. Go for it. So recently, I've I've run into two situations where uh, I know somebody who left a career because they, quite honestly, they they're uh, they're just a dinosaur and they refuse to reinvent themselves. Uh, they've refused to embrace some technology and some things like that, and the company had to let them go. And then I know another uh, uh, contractor who his business is flailing because he refuses to reinvent himself and learn new things. And so I'm curious how over the last maybe decade, let's just go back maybe 10 years, how you have had to reinvent yourself as a contractor in order to win in the game. Oh boy, that's a great story. Good, good topic to touch on. Um, 2007, business for me was booming. We were doing $2 million a year. We had 20 guys out work and we were just big, big, big growing like crazy, but the profits weren't there. Okay, Tom. So one thing that I want my contractors to know, whether you're a single guy just starting out or whether you have four or five guys under your belt, that everybody thinks growing bigger is better. And that's absolutely, that's the death knell. That's the trap that's going to stop wreck your business. Before you focus on growth, I want you to focus on profitability, okay? Who cares if you're doing $2 million a year, but you don't have the profits to show at the end of the year? That's where we were at. And you're probably saying, oh, that's just you. If I was at $2 million, I'd make a lot of money. Well, you know what? That may be true. It may not be true. But let me just let me share my story with you. 2007, we were doing $2 million. The money wasn't coming in. I was losing my hair. I was going crazy, running five job sites. Life was miserable. It was reflecting on my personal life, my family life, everything around me. And I said, you know what? There's got to be a better way. And I sat down with my core group of guys. So out of 20 guys, I had probably seven of them that I really liked and thought should be in the company. The rest were, they were fluff. They were just guys that were there to earn a check. They weren't committed to the quality of the company. And I said, guess what, guys? We are going to intentionally shrink the company by 50%. So what we were going to do is we were going to fire all those jobs that we had that weren't making them money. And we were going to get rid of about half of the crew that wasn't really performing up to par. So we were, we, instead of growing, we were going to do the exact opposite. And then the big collapse came in 2007. 
And so the collapse actually helped us shrink our company by more than 50%. We were already, Mm -hmm. and it wasn't because I knew it was coming and I, you know, I was able to predict ahead of time or anything like that, Tom. Realistically, what it was, was I just got lucky. I would, you need to ride that wave though. You man, you, you made a brilliant business decision. That's what you got to tell people. uh, (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, people, if they talk to me for more than five minutes, they'll know that that wasn't the truth. So they're, they're probably like, there's nothing brilliant about that guy. Um, (laughs) But in reality, it shrunk our company by more than 50%. But what the the plan was we had implemented at that time is when you're in in construction, you are, and if some of these people have heard me before, they'll hear it. But if you're listening to me the first time, this is a really important point. When you're in construction, when you're in landscaping, excavating, I don't care what you're doing, you're the jack of all trades and master of none. Okay, which means you don't do anything very well, but you have the skill set to be able to do everything, especially in landscaping. If you have a skid loader, a backhoe, a track hoe, any kind of heavy piece of equipment, you're putting it to work everywhere you possibly can because hours on the machine relate to dollars in your pocket, right? Um, But you're not doing any of it very efficiently. And so I sat down with my guys and I said, we are going to shrink by 50 percent, but we're going to specialize while we do that. We're going to take two areas, and instead of being the jack of all trades, master of none, we are now going to be the jack of all trades, master of two. And I say two because it's called strategic diversification. Okay, This is an important concept to to bring into your scope of your own business because you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. Because you will find that business is cyclical. You'll have all sorts of work over here along these lines and then nothing probably for six months or a year. And then all of a sudden you'll get like in our in our industry, I may have five houses to demo right in a row. And then I may not demo another single house for three months, four months, five months. And if all my businesses is demo, well, guess what? I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs. So if you have two specific lines of work that you are very good at, that's going to help you along. In our, ca- our case, we also refine that process even further by saying that we are going to do what we call a generalized specialty, which is retaining walls, which means everybody in the industry can build a retaining wall. But we are going to master that. And that's harder to master when you have a high end, a lot of competition, Mm -hmm. a lot of people that can still do that. But we're going to master. We're going to set ourselves apart from that whole population that can build them and become known as the best of the best in retaining walls. And then we're going to take something that's more of a niche. And that's something that not a lot of people do. And that's swimming pool removal. Okay, there's very few, very little competition. And that's easier to master. Okay, you don't have as big of a market, but you have two niches now. And they have a different level of mastery for each one. So you can master the, the, the smaller niche much faster, less people involved in it. And then you refine the process for each niche. Okay, So then you take these two areas of specialty that you're really, really good at. And then you boil them down and you get rid of all the excess, all the things that eat up your profits, all the time constraints, all those things. You throw them out the door. Right. You get it to the point where now, like for a swimming pool removal, it's three and a half days before it used to be five days, six days You before you didn't know. Mm-hmm. Right. So whatever area you guys and gals out there work in, you need to be if you're if you're a baker. I mean, hey, I talk to people that are in all gamuts of their business, but, you know, cleaning people, uh, all sorts of different companies. If you're a baker pick, you know, hey, I'm the best at these oddball cupcakes or whatever, something that you can get known at. Right. Right. And that's, a, that's an important thing that's part of the process. But what we discovered is when we dropped down and we specialized, it took a few years. But then we were doing, instead of doing $2 million a year, we were doing between half a million and three quarters of a million dollars a year in business. And we had the same profits when we were at $2 million. Yeah, you're, you're you know, less busy and making more money. I mean, that's never a bad thing. You know, um, let me ask you this. You talked about narrowing it down to those two niches. Yeah. How did you choose those? How, how, what, what advice do you give people when they know they need to narrow something down and they don't know where to go? Well, what's their strengths? You know, realistically, there's no generalized statement that I can say that's going to help everybody. So what I want them to do is, what are you good at? What are you interested in? There's going to be certain areas that you naturally migrate towards. And there's a saying, and this is what this is really what we want to focus on, is this, this saying is, if you focus on 
Uh, I got to think about it, Tommy, because you're kind of hitting me on a left field here. But it goes so long. So I'm like, if you focus on building up your weakness, you will become mediocre at best. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on building upon your strengths, you will dominate your market. So whatever you're strong at, that's what I want you to focus on becoming the absolute best at. And whatever you're mediocre at, get rid of it. Just mm-hmm. don't don't focus on it. Don't worry about it. Don't put your energy in it, into it, your effort into it, because that's where your profits become marginal. When you are focusing on something you're very strong at, you are going to learn how to do that better than everybody else, and it's going to show at the end of the year. So, so these uh, the one area was the the pool removal. The other was retaining walls. And retaining walls, you said, is a super competitive market. You got a lot of competition, uh, and you touched on, you know, being a master at that, being the experts in differentiating. How were you able to differentiate in such a competitive field? Perfect question. Difficult answer. So this is what I did. You have to come up with a concept. If you have a lot of competition, how do you separate yourself? And the way I separate myself is I tell my customers that we are a structural retaining wall company. I said, you have landscaping companies, you have concrete companies, and then you have us. We master structural retaining walls, which means walls that are four feet and over are our specialty. Walls that hold up auditoriums, walls that hold up parking lots, Double-tiered walls that may be 14 feet tall holding up an 11-foot tall holding up a mansion on the top of a hill is what we're good at. So if you happen to have a wall that's like that, you hire us because it takes a certain level of geotechnical engineering um, and, and civil engineering and an understanding of soil dynamics that landscape companies don't typically have. And then I go into not only those qualifications and show them jobs that we've done to make them feel good about their four foot garden wall that they may want, okay? Because if they feel that they're getting somebody that can build a a wall that's gonna hold up a stadium or a parking lot or a townhome association, they feel, feel pretty good about you coming into their backyard. But then I go even further without getting complicated and say, Here's what you're going to find our competition is telling you. So then I, I put my mind frame of what they do, and I've seen what they do. And I say, here's the blocks they use. Here's the installation techniques they use because this is standard in the industry. That is exactly what we don't do. We are not standard. Here's how we differentiate ourselves from our competition. You will find we use these blocks instead of the blocks that you'll find they typically quote you. We use this installation method because we found that after 20 years, you won't be calling us back. Our walls will still be straight and tall as they were the day we installed them. So we've already time tested a lot of the techniques and know that you're not going to have any issues. And then I can go even further into it and compare and contrast this by saying, hey, I've done I've every year I probably tear out at least 10 to 15,000 square feet of my competition's retaining walls. And I find that this is how they've got those walls built. And it's really typical across the industry. And so that all those things help my customers get a better understanding if we're qualified to do their job or not. So when you um, when you're laying in bed and you think, you know, you wake up in the morning, you go, hey, I'm going to we're going to attack this uh, retaining wall market a little differently like this. You know, the bigger walls and stuff make it a niche of ours. Once that decision is made. How do you then go about marketing to that new niche? It's just about communication. It's got to be a reflection on your website. So if, let's let's kind of deviate a little bit from the retaining wall market, if you don't mind, Tom. Yeah. Because I want to make this more generalized. I don't want to talk very specifically about what I do. I want to talk about what we can do for help the contractors out there. So, uh, you know, whether it's a, a highly specialized niche or a more generalized niche, you've got to educate yourself on the process. Now, it's already your strength. Hopefully, you've picked something that you're good at. And now you've got to figure out what is your competition doing and then how do you overcome what they're doing and do it better and relate that message to your audience? Okay. And that's really about what it is. The most successful restaurants out there, they have better food, better portions, um, or they have, you know, a better atmosphere or whatever it is. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. There's always a way to improve upon what your competition is doing. So you use them as your baseline 
and everything that you have to do has to be a little bit better and then you have to be able to market that to your audience without coming off as being condescending. Got it. No, that's good stuff. So I want to um my mind is going a million different places right now cuz I'm this is this is some great stuff that that's helpful to a lot of different people. I want to um ask a more general question that's not necessarily contractor based because I think the answer will help a lot of people. Um, you've been creating content for quite a while now, you know, the podcast and your videos and things like that. Um, how has creating content, how has creating content helped your business? Uh, I learn from my guests. So I, every guest that I interview, every a interaction I have during the day, whether it's a guest online, a, a video that I produce, or just every person that I talk to, I actually sit down. I don't just, I'm not in that moment. I'm just, uh, you know, it's, it's not, hey, you know, what kind of light, fluffy engagement can I have with this person? I'm actually focused just absolutely like a sniper on a, on a target on what they're telling me and trying to bring the most important, valuable points into my own company and then also taking away from them what they're giving us and how we can apply it toward contractors. I've, I said what like one of the videos I made was uh, I gotten a question from from one of the people and they were um, it, it worried about bringing in overqualified people into their company when those people help build the business, you know, if they left because they didn't feel confident enough that they could hold on to them long enough. Mm -hmm. um, well, you know, what would happen to their company is when they leave, they don't they don't take all their skills with them. I said, you as the owner, take those with you. You as the owner, learn from them. It's like you are now hiring a consultant and that's what consultants do. They come into a company, they transform it, but they leave behind them the systems that they put into place. They leave behind them the skills that they brought in. So they're extremely valuable. So every time I'm talking to somebody, uh, Tom, really what I'm doing is I'm learning everything I possibly can and then giving it out, <laughs> sending it right back out to the audience so that they can take it away with them. So the videos that I produce is a lot of times if I've interviewed a guest and if something's really connected, I'll make a video on it. But I'll I'll use the, the skills that they have and make it specific toward contractors because we are under a unique set of conditions. We don't just – we're not like a banking industry or a dental industry or anything like that. Contractors work with our hands. We work on crews. So I don't care what kind of contractor you are. Are And then we're technicians on top of it. So really what we've got to do is we've got to understand that the technical aspect, we've got to master that. And then we also have the unique challenge that we have to master the, the business end of it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't master both ends of it, you're going to be a really good craftsman, but you're not going to be a really good businessman and you're not going to have a lot of profits. Or maybe you're a really good businessman, but you don't have any good technicians to install it and your complaints are going to go up. Right. So if you don't have both of those ends mastered, your business is going to fail. And that is very universal across the board. And so that's what I try to focus on is I don't try to teach my contractors how to do what they do because that ha they have to understand that that's the very first set of skills. And I go, hey, you know what, that you're on your own because I can't teach countertop installers how to do their work. I don't know how to do it. That's what you when you master that. And then after that. You have to give up that technical skill. You have to pass that, those skills along to somebody else that can actually do the installations for you, can actually get the projects done for you. But you have to now understand how to run your business, which is absolutely huge, intimidating, complicated. But once you've ran a business, it's super simple. It's like looking at the Rubik's Cube, Tom. Okay. So when you look at the Rubik's Cube, imagine that's a business and you're like, oh my God, how do I solve this thing? But you got those guys out there that can just go da -da 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 -da, and they solve the Rubik's Cube, right? Yeah. Well, that's what a business is. A business is the Rubik's Cube. And after you know the equations, after you know how to, to set all the systems up in place, it's da -da 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 -da, done on to the next one. Okay. That's where a lot of guys just don't get it. And that's my focus with the podcast, the Landscape Business Pro, and with just helping reaching out to people is to help people solve that Rubik's Cube, plain and simple. It is a puzzle, man. And, and, and you know, one of the most complicated pieces of the puzzle that I hear, <clears throat> excuse me, over and over from uh, business owners in many different industries is finding good people. 
and uh, you know that having that balance between having enough people to do the work when you're busy. Have you ever run into that situation? Like you got a lot of work and not enough guys. <laughs> all the time, all, all the time. So what do you, what do you tell that <clears throat> business owner who's li- listening to this right now? And he just, um, his phone's ringing off the hook. He's closing deals. He's even raised his prices and he's still selling more work. He's booked out three, four months. Um, what do you tell that guy about finding people? It's constant recruitment. Okay, Tom, constant recruitment. You never stop because you're in competition with every other company out there. There is a shortage, a universal shortage of people right now. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. It's just consistent across the board. Okay. Um, And so you advertise 24-7 for jobs, right? We're going to... So then you have to advertise 24-7 to bring people into your company, even when you don't need them. You want to constantly be improving your personnel in your company, right? And that shows two things, constant recruitment. So maybe you have on the sides of your trucks, I'm now hiring. Maybe you have a whole page on your website looking for awesome people. Um, You just constantly are looking. But what that's going to do is that's going to keep the guys that you already have on your crew sharp as a tack. Yeah, it is. Right. Because they're worried. So if you're not if you're not bringing interviewing, bringing new people in every now and then your guys are going to go down to that least common factor that they can get away with, which hurts you as the business owner, because there's no no need for them to keep striving to try to improve what they do because there's no competition. But if they get even the threat, even the inkling that somebody new is going to come into the company, whoa, what's what's this new person going to do? What am I? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then they get that mind frame like, oh, I better step up my game. Otherwise, I could be replaced. You know, that that reminds me of uh, it's it's really similar to the professional sports world. You know, if I'm if I'm a field goal kicker and I miss a field goal, there's a pressure that they're going to hire somebody else. And I've seen it all the time, and especially in the trades, we settle for what we get. We're afraid to lose guys. We're afraid to turn the heat up on people with expectations of performance and things like that in the business. And I think you nailed it on the head. When you're constantly recruiting and bringing new people in, it it puts that that gentle pressure on people that man, I got to do my job, or they're going to replace me. Exactly. And that's, that's not being mean. It's not being cruel. It's being it's being a wise business owner who's protecting you know, not only your brand, but you're protecting your family, you're protecting your future and the future of the, the right people that are in your company for the long haul. And if you're more profitable, you're probably going to be able to give the guys that are in your company bigger raises, better benefits. So it helps them out by getting the absolute most you can out of your people. You're actually helping them out. So what? They got a little bit of pressure. Well, who, who cares? You're a business owner. You, you we're faced with pressure every single day. So let, let the guys feel a little bit of the pressure and, and work to their absolute utmost that they possibly can. And constantly recruiting also does another thing. It lets the world know, like when you pull up to a job site, if they see now hiring on there, you may be going, well, that kind of gives a bad impression like I'm shorthanded. Or it could leave the impression that you're a growing, expanding company. Right. So it's not a bad thing to let the world see that you can use more help. You're in demand, man. You're in demand, man. It's always a good thing. So let's, uh, let's rewind, uh, maybe not to when you were 13, because we're all total dorks when we're that age. Um, but... Uh, I think I'm still a dork, Tom. Yeah, well, I, 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 I don't know. I've been called that a couple times. Now, I have a so. theory that men never, we never really get out of junior high. <laughs> so we're, we're just bigger <laughs> junior high students. But anyway, uh, it's another conversation. <laughs> uh, I'm cracking myself up over here. So the uh, um, rewind, you know, maybe 20 years ago and you got, you got the young Stan, the contractor, and then you fast forward now to Stan, the 43 year old contractor what would uh, what would that younger version of you think of what you've become? Um, I, I guess I wish I would have amped my game up earlier, looked for more opportunities, okay? Because as a contractor, if you fall into the trap of, of being satisfied with where you're at, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities, chances to grow, ways to refine your company. And so, you know, we didn't have back 20 years ago, we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have computers. Hell, I had a cell phone that looked like a brick. I could pound nails with it, right, Tom? Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so a lot of that information that is available today wasn't back then, right? So I'm not going to make excuses about what, what it is, but right now I want to focus on you have the opportunity to learn absolutely everything you possibly can. The information is starting to get out there, especially for contracting. It's there's not a, it's not great information. There's not a ton of it out there, Tom. I don't know what you're finding. What are, what are you finding for good information out there? Um, well, videos like yours. I mean, I stumbled across your channel a few months ago, a couple months ago, and and. Um, you know, personally, I, I listen to a lot of different podcasts. That's where, and I just relate it to the contracting world. Well, so, that's, that's you know, it. That's so the point. that's why you and I got to do this stuff. So it's, yeah, so that's it. That's the market yeah. that's missing. There's, it's not, we need to actually have it. So it's specifically lined up for contractors because what you're doing is the same thing I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm listening, I'm listening to contractors. Well, here's a, I use, I've used this example before, but John Gray, men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think maybe some of my listeners may have heard this before, so I apologize. But for the new guys out there, I listened to him on a podcast three years ago, and I was absolutely blown away by this guy. And what this, what, what really pertains to us as business owners, part of the Rubik's Cube going back to owning the business, not being the technician, is being – uh, is being able to concentrate, being able to focus on our job. And I called John Gray up and like, hey, will you come on my show? And he's like, I have nothing to do with contractors. And I'm like, you have everything to do with business owners. And he didn't understand the connection. Mm -hmm. But the, but the connection was after I explained to him, he's like, oh, my God, I didn't realize that. The connection was this guy had Parkinson's. He was dying from this disease, which kills people. It's incurable. He went down to Mexico, hooked IVs up to himself and sat in a room full of drug and you know, heroin and cocaine addicts. Right. Mm -hmm. Try, trying to come off from they were trying to you know cure themselves of their addiction. He was trying to cure himself of Parkinson's. What he found is while he was curing himself of this disease, he was able to super concentrate. I will tell you that I think business owners in general are the most distracted people on the face of the planet. Yeah. I think that they get way too many things going on and they don't do any of the business technical, the business end, not the technical end, the business end of their companies very well because they got too, too many, they're juggling too many balls at once. Okay. If you have an ability, a way to concentrate, you have an, a, a way that you can prioritize. Prior, prioritization is a huge factor in our company and understand what is important, what is not important and not feel like you have that nagging sense that you've got to do, you got to answer that email. Well, no, you don't have to answer that email. And the, the dude, like we are sitting here right now, I've got project uh, foreman's out in the field right now texting me and I'm looking at the text going, you can wait. Because this is a priority and I'm not worried about it right now. Okay, Tom? Yeah. So if, as a business owner, if you have that ability and when he shared what, how he was able to cure himself of Parkinson's and a, and a side effect was laser focus. And it was just a combination of minerals in the morning, grapeseed extract and vitamin C. And it's something that I thought, man, if we can get business owners to concentrate more, if this can help them. And that's what I was saying to you, Tom, is we pull those nuggets away from other people and apply it toward contracting, apply it toward running a construction company of some sort where we are, you know, trying to help our our fellow people out in the trades improve their processes because we we bust ass. We work hard. And uh, I feel that contractors in general just it's the toughest. I think it's one of the toughest businesses out there. Yeah, I, 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 there, it's a unique skill set that, that we need. And I, I wrote an article a while back for a, a painting uh, site, a painting contracting site, and I talked about, um, you know, some of the things as a contractor that, that you, you know, when you just send somebody to somebody's house, that person has to be part social worker. <laughs> um, they've they've got to be, you know, friendly and can communicate well. they got to have a certain amount of, there's some strength, there's some finesse, there's some mobility and flex. I mean, you start really looking at the skill set that you need to have as a contractor or the employee of a contracting business. It's, it's pretty unique if you're going to excel in that field. And, um, you know, you, you touched on focus there a lot, and I want to revisit that. You know, I, I think um, we're, we're an incredibly 
distracted society. I mean, I, I read a report, I think it was from 2012, that a goldfish actually beats us in focus by like a second or two. <laughs> so it, it's crazy because our minds are just skipping along all the information that's flying at us every day. And it's, it's really um, making that commitment to understanding. I mean, we all say we want to get focused, but I think even start before that, it's understanding what your job is as the CEO of your business. Actually, Tom, I want to share with you what I think is one of the absolute most important things you can do in your business. Go for it. Okay. Um, it builds off from what you said when you were t talking about sending your guys out on the job site. Mm -hmm. It's something, it's a quote from Maya Angelou. Okay. And she said, people will never remember what you said. They will never remember what you did but they will always remember how you made them feel. Bingo. And I want to back this up with a scientific study that was done. Okay, this is huge. As a contractor, I want you guys to tone in, to tune into this thing. This is massive. There were six men, six women that were asked to, to determine out of 65 doctors which ones were sued for malpractice. Okay, mm. these six men and six women were giving we're given a 10 second clip of the doctor talking to the patient to determine which one's just a 10 second clip. But now on top of that, the words that the doctors were saying to the patients were muffled, were muffled. They couldn't even hear the flipping words that they were, the doctors were saying to the patients. These six men and six women had a 95% success rate determining which doctors were sued for malpractice. And the reason is, is it was in the tone of the voice. They determined that if the doctor didn't make the patient feel like they were cared for, mm -hmm. they had a much higher rate of being sued for malpractice. But if the doctor, doesn't matter what the doctor did, doesn't matter what the doctor said. Now remember, it doesn't matter what the doctor said. The words were muffled. But if the doctor made the person feel like the doctor cared about them, even if that doctor flipping messed up, he wasn't going to get sued for malpractice. And guess what? As a contractor, if you make your customers feel like you care about their job, you can do mediocre work and still have a high success rate, still have word of mouth advertising, still have customers loving everything you do. You've yeah. got to get away from that technical end of it. You got to get away from the fact that I'm going to pour all of my energy into absolutely producing something that nobody else can replicate. Because the customer, if you if you've done that, but you haven't made the customer feel like they're connected with the process or they're an important part of the process or you're doing this to make them happy where you haven't made them feel like it. Now, maybe that's your intention, but you haven't actually connected with the customer. Mm -hmm. It's not going to matter. It's not going to matter at all. You've got to actually make the connection with the customer. That's the most important thing. Your complaints are going to go down. Yeah. Word of mouth is going to go boom. Spread like wildfire. It's all about the experience they have. You know, it's, uh, we used to, in my old painting company years ago, we used to tell um, tell our, our crew leaders all the time, not that we should do mediocre work and not that we did, but, um, you know, the, the client is going to remember exactly what you said, how they were treated, how they felt, more than they're, re they're going to remember the actual paint job or whatever, you know, it is that we're doing. And so it's how they felt. Um you know, the, uh, oh man, I just had something like really brilliant that was going to support everything you just said. Now I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> I've, see, we're distracted, aren't we? It's, uh, all right, hold on. It's coming back to me. Shoot. Oh, this is awful. All right. And th th see, we don't edit this either. We just let it roll because this is real life, man. So, um, making people. Uh, making people feel a certain way is um, is totally a secret weapon, I think, for business owners. And you now I remember what I was going to say. So the uh, and th the people that know me that are listening to this are not surprised, by the way. So um, one of the questions I used to ask people when when um, when I was selling them paint jobs and stuff. And it has to do with what you said about how we make people feel is I, I would say, hey, listen, you know, Stan, when when your house is painted or the patio is built or whatever the heck's going on here, when your house is painted, you've handed your check to the contractor, they get in their van and they start driving away. 
How are you going to know you hired the right guy? Okay, say it again, Tom. Stan, when your house is painted, the job is done, and you hand your check to that contractor, whether it's me or whoever else you choose to hire, and they're pulling away in their van, how are you going to know that you hired the right guy? Mm. And then I just shut up and I listen, because it's at that moment they're really going to share with you what part of the experience is going to make them feel great. And, you know, I've had people tell me, you know, this is where, uh, and this is a whole other topic on sales, but, you know, what do most business owners do, not just contractors, we show up and we throw up. You know, we barf about how great our business is and how we're this and we're that. And we talk about a bunch of stuff that's not really that important to the customer. You know, but then when you learn to ask a great question and you shut up and they say, well, you know, the last guy we hired left a mess and my wife had to clean it up for three days. And so, you know, you do a good paint job and my wife doesn't have to clean up for three, you know, clean up after you guys. I'm, I'm going to be a happy camper. So what you're actually talking about, Tom, is when you go in to do your initial proposal, your first meeting with the customer. Or it and, could be over the phone in our pre-qualification process or whatever it is. But, you know, I think those are important conversations to have. Even, even when you send your foreman out to a job and he's, you know, walking the project beforehand with the homeowner or whatever the heck it is or the customer. Or even if you're a restaurant owner and you come up and your server asks somebody who's eating there, hey, you know, thanks for coming in today. What, what's going to make you guys feel like your, t your time and money was well spent here today? Charisma. So it boils down to charisma. And charisma is a learnable thing. Anybody can have charisma. I don't care what you look like. It has nothing to do with what you look like, Tom. It has absolutely nothing to do with how you look. Charisma is based on two factors. So, And that leaves an impression. And it really what it, it – it's sad to, to know that the statistics show that handsome, charismatic people land more jobs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to teach you the two basic elements of charisma. The first one is competence. Okay. You've got to, you've got to be comfortable, confident uh, about the topic that you're speaking on. Okay. The second one is you have to be warm. You have to be friendly. Okay. You, you know, you, you got to have a certain level. You, you want to be clean and, and presentable, of course, but it doesn't have to be over the top, right? You don't have to be dressed to the nines. You can, it does not matter. You guys and gals out there, you know that you've spent at parties and you've seen the person that seems to get everybody's attention. It's because they're comfortable speaking, they're comfortable in their own skin, and they're warm and friendly. Those are the two elements, and you have to bring that into your initial proposals, into your interactions with people, and practice makes permanent. Practice makes permanent. So practice at the Lion and Subway. Practice at a – go to a Toastmasters meeting and practice there. Go to a B&I meeting and practice there. Practice at the grocery store. Practice when you're with your neighbors across the street. If you don't – if you're not those two things – then you're not going to be it when dollar bills are on the line. That's when you really – you don't want to practice going out to meet customers for the first time. You don't want to practice when you're trying to teach your project foremans how to do this as well. That's when you've got to be able to do it. You can practice all, every single day you have opportunities. Every time you speak with somebody, whether it's on the phone, when you're on the phone – Let's say you're talking to a complete stranger, make it a point to get them engaged, to get them to the, to the level where maybe they laugh and they, you, they feel comfortable. Practice then and there. I don't care where you're at, but practice those elements and that's going to increase your signatory rate. That means when you leave a job site, if the customer feels good about you as a person, then you're probably going to be hired and it's not going to be so much about price because that's the beauty about what we do. Man, it's not about price all the time. Right. A lot, a lot of the times, the low, the low bidder gets thrown out the door. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, the the low bidder, they're like, oh man, I don't know what this guy's thinking. The high bidder, sometimes they get thrown out. You want to be in the middle. You really just want to be the middle guy. And if you're the middle guy, you're going to be signing jobs. If you're the middle guy with personality, you're going to be busy. You're going to be out three to six months. Mm -hmm. OK, and those are the elements that are going to help you out uh, immensely. That's good stuff, man. So I want to uh, I want to wrap it up with uh, a question. I want to put you in a scenario here and uh, and we'll end with this. So you're uh, you got the you got the stage in front of a thousand business owners, all different types of business owners. And, you know, you get maybe five minutes. 
what uh, what one piece of your mind or message would you want to instill in that group of business owners if you had the chance? Okay, running a business is um, there's just so many topics, Tom, that we can go down. So many different roads to go down. Uh, it's and it boils down to learning every day. I guess would be one of the things. Um, and if you think you're right, then you're wrong. Okay, mm-hmm. you you have to keep engaged. You have to, you know, a, a good example, Tom, was, you know, look look at. Uh, I went to Costa Rica here not too long ago, and I realized that it was within a week I had lost my edge. So you as a business owner have to have an edge. And in just being out of the loop for one week, you know how you just kind of start to let your guard down. Mm -hmm. You start to feel comfortable. Well, when you're a business owner, you have to stay sharp. And being sharp is what's going to being being have paying attention to those details and putting the right systems in place, putting the right people in place is going to make the difference. You have to know your business inside and out and you have to feel comfortable with all the different processes. And so that you have to go from the technical end of it towards the business end of it. And I think once you once you realize there's that switch, that inevitable switch, you're going to improve your profitabilities. And don't be afraid to ask for help. But be very critical of that help as well, because the people that you bring in here's here's one thing that kind of bothers me, Tom. Is is a lot of the the people out there that are offering advice don't have any practical experience doing what we do, mm-hmm. and so I just I, I I actually just sit there and cringe when I listen to these people or watch these people, and it's like you're trying to put a broad blanket over every business every business out there and you can't do it you've got to actually you know hone in to help very certain kinds of businesses and so a lot of the the information that works for you know like i said investment banking or financial institutes has nothing to do with you or i Mm -hmm. and so just make sure that you have the right fit the the you're qualifying who you're talking to it's a huge thing you surround yourself, uh, you become the average of the five people you hang out with, right? So, good old Jim Rohn quote there. Yeah. Is that Jim Rohn? I always wondered where that came from. Yeah it's, uh, yeah, it's funny. If you look at your hand right now, you got five fingers, right? Four fingers and a thumb, and the average is in the middle, and that makes you the middle finger. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, twisted humor on a uh, yeah. Wednesday morning, I guess. So, But anyway, um, but you know, that that's... Uh, all kidding aside, I, I've definitely found that when you surround yourself with with winners, man, you're going to be a winner. So, hey, I got a question for you, Tom. Before uh, you let me go, yeah. when you've asked that question to other people in the past, mm-hmm. to you, what has been the most powerful and impact most impactful statement that you've heard yet? About the one thing you'd share with? Yes, uh, yes. You know, I've never asked it on the show before. Oh, um, it would be good to. It would be good to. You know to find out what you find, you know, what you learn from a statement like that, because that's a pretty, pretty powerful statement. It is, you know, you got five minutes in front of a group of thousands of your peers, you know, what would you tell them? So that's, uh, I'd be interested. And if you're listening to the show today, um, go ahead and email me at Tom at motorhard.com and tell me what you would share with, uh, with a thousand business owners, one bit of advice. I love that question, Tom. That's cool. That is a very cool question. That's a tough question. Maybe you should tell your guests you're going to ask that question at the end of the show. Prepare you a little. Yeah, I just, I just made, I just, I just made it up, man, on the fly here. So I was uh, just thinking it'd be cool. So, well, Stan, how can um, how can people find you? How can they reach you if they want to learn more? They want to have you come speak. They want to watch your videos. Whatever it is, tell us how we can find you. First off, I'm a contractor by trade. That's how I make my living, okay? My business is genetic, G-E-N-A-D-E-K.com. So that's where all, that's that's what I do. I have fun. I enjoy putting on the podcast. I enjoy interviewing people, and that's at landscapebusinesspro.com. After doing this for 30 years, what I do is I take the contracting trade and I blend it with all the things that other people do. I pull out their nuggets and I give it to contractors. Um, I also do that on a YouTube channel. I think it's Stanley Genetic Landscape and Construction Business Pro. Um, so that's how they can find me. If they want to email me, I every single thing a person sends my way, I read and I respond to, believe it or not. Uh, and that's stan at landscapebusinesspro.com. 
so those are the ways. Hopefully, hopefully we've given uh, the audience a few takeaways, something that they can apply toward their business. I hope so. That's the that's the whole point. It is, man. Well, I appreciate you hanging out with me a little bit today, and um, I'll put uh, these links and stuff in the show notes for everybody so they can find you. And uh, man, I I really appreciate you uh, hanging out today. Tom, thank you. I appreciate you having me on the show. And uh, hey, guess what, buddy? Motor hard. There you go. We'll take it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. So, hey, uh, thanks for hanging out with us today, everybody. Um, check out those show notes and hook up with, with Stan and watch his stuff, listen to his podcast. And if you wouldn't mind, head over to uh, iTunes and give the Strongpreneur podcast a review and rating because that helps us uh, obviously get more visible and help more people who want to build strong lives and strong businesses. We'll see you guys next time.